Well, it's been really a wonderful thing for me to see the outpouring of affection that so many of us have for Stuart. As everyone has pointed out, you know, he has a powerful intellect, uh, infectious love of physics, uh, extraordinarily broad interests, and how much fun it was to talk physics with him. And uh, everyone mentioned his sense of humor. Uh, but tactness uh, wasn't one of Stewart's strong points. And it wasn't one of mine either. <laughs> And so I've got to uh, give you this little disclaimer. <laughs> I first met Stuart about 40 years ago. And I immediately felt a kind of uh, bond and kinship uh, with, with Stuart, OK? Uh, we were uh, both uh, sort of inherently skeptical. Uh, we both uh, felt it sure didn't take very much to get theorists excited about things. And uh, although I haven't really collaborated with Stuart uh, since, you know, 30 or some years ago, okay, and I only ran into him, you know, periodically, uh, I, I, I always enjoyed him tremendously. I felt very close uh, to Stuart that he was a really very good friend, okay? And in all this time, and it's a long time, okay, and lots of things we talked about, there was only one sticking point, okay, one place where Stuart and I went <laughs> like this. And that was Stuart's dirt bike, okay? Because I'm a guy that believes in muscle powered activities, you know, and stuff like that. And I hate dirt bikes, I hate snowmobiles, okay? And uh, the fact that Stuart, uh, you know, also, uh, you know, <coughs> did uh, sailplanes, gliders, and sailboats. Uh, you know, th that helped a little bit, but it, it didn't get over the fundamental problem. Okay. So uh, my last interaction was sustained interaction with Stuart was um, a few years ago. Uh, Stuart sent me a list of papers about something I didn't know anything about, which was this uh, uh, Remarkable GSI result. Actually, it's the second remarkable GSI result. Right? And uh, it was, uh, uh, and so I first read the experimental papers. You know, they were looking at the decay of uh, electron capture decay of hydrogen like, you know, heavy ions in the storage ring, and they saw oscillations. And then they were all, it had something to do with neutrino mass differences and everything. You know, I read these theory papers, you know, famous people. And I'm not going to mention any names here out of charity, okay? And, <laughs> you know, I read these papers. And I couldn't figure it out, you know. I just couldn't figure it out. So I, I, I called Stuart up and said, you know, I just can't figure this out. It's just crazy. And he said, uh, well, why don't you and Boris and I get together here in Berkeley and see if we can make any sense out of this, okay? And, you know, I just couldn't figure out what was going on. But, but I love... Stuart and I love Boris, and this sounded like a lot of fun. So uh, we came down, and uh, you know we, we agreed this couldn't have anything to do with uh, you know neutrino flavors. I mean, you know, to put it really simply, if I have you know a nuclear state and it decays two different ways, uh, you know those two lifetimes don't interfere. You know, they and, and, and really that's the issue. Okay. And but you know all these famous people and all these papers. There's the whole industry of all this. You know, I, uh, gosh, what am I missing here? So you know, we both, we all three thought this is nothing to do with neutrinos. But you know, what is it? Maybe it's real, but it's it's something else. You know, and that's a very tiny energy difference. And so we figured, well, it can't. There's nothing fundamental here. It's got to be something. You know, about the storage ring somehow. And we thought, well, how do you get such a long time? Uh, uh, you know, don't think about it as a really tiny energy difference. Just think about it as some very weak process, you know. And it could be, Stuart pointed out, at least I hadn't uh, recognized it, that in this particular case, you know, you have a, a spin one 
uh, nucleus uh, and uh, a, a spin a half electron, and then you go to a spin zero state and, and a neutrino. So you have you know f equals one half and f equals three halves, but only the, in the initial state. But the final state is only f equals one half. And so maybe what's happening is you're making transitions between these two, and it's the period of Rabi oscillations that you're looking at. Okay, it's not that. But, but you know that depended all on the details of these rings and everything, and, and we couldn't really figure it out. And uh, you know both of us thought you know there's something funny here, but we couldn't prove anything. And uh, recently a paper appeared. Uh, I'm, I'm thankful to Jerry for uh, rank, raising this whole subject, so I don't have to go over it. But this is the suppose you know the, the, a newer paper showing the oscillations. The seven second period is still there. The amplitude has gotten two times smaller. You know, th that's generally a sign if you do a better experiment, the effect gets smaller. <laughs> that's not necessarily a confidence builder. But who knows? But I, I, I am willing to bet a hell of a lot of money that's got nothing to do with neutrino oscillations. So now I want to turn, you know, that, that was fun. I always have a great time talking with Stuart and then uh, going over and uh, ta uh, talking with Joyce uh, afterwards. You know, it, it's always a, a very deeply friendly, wonderful thing. Uh, so now I'll turn the clock back to 1980s, okay? Fishbach discovered a, a fifth force by reanalyzing some old equivalence principle data, okay? And several experiments at GSI were finding narrow E plus E minus lines, okay? In these heavy ion collisions. And again, I'm thankful to John for giving us the background here, okay? And uh, at, at this time, Blaine Heckel and I had begun a, uh, a, 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 some torsion balance experiments to check this idea of a fifth force, okay? <coughs> And uh, th th there was uh, the m m many different claims about this fifth force, okay? We found nothing, but there were all these other people that found something, okay? And so they had a Morion conference to talk about these two things, so it had this split focus, okay? And so, you know, I, I started out going to the, the, these fifth force talks. And, you know, they were, a lot of them were kind of flaky. <laughs> So then I went over to the sessions where they were talking about these GSI things, okay? And uh, I, I was really uh, shocked, okay? Because the, the little science guys, the fifth force guys, okay, uh, weren't any more flaky than those big science guys doing these E plus E minus collaborations. And, and again, I, I couldn't figure it out, you know? The, one group over here was seeing some lines but it was a really hard experiment, it was, okay, but, but the effect kept on coming and going away, and they said, well, the targets are deteriorating, and this and that, and all that, and the other group was saying, yeah, that's just the same thing we're seeing, you know, it comes and goes, and the targets deteriorate, and you just gotta pick out just the right time, you know, and, and the whole thing like that, and I thought, my God, I can't believe this, because the lines were in different places, as John already pointed out, you know, they're not confirming each other, this is crazy. And, and, and so somehow seeing the uh, ubiquity of flakiness <laughs> well, well, was really a, 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 an eye-opener, okay? But, you know, for instance, in the fifth force things, there were some people that, uh, you know, we saw nothing. There were some people that saw uh, a, an effect with one sign and some other people saw an effect of the opposite sign, and they said, yeah, not only do we have a fifth force, we've got a sixth force, okay? And, and uh, Val, Telegdi, <laughs> Val Telegdi told a great joke about this. He said, you know, there were these two guys that made a lot of money in the stock market, and uh, somewhat unusually, they were also cultured people. So they took their money, and they decided they were gonna each buy villas in Rome. And so, you know, they bought these nice villas in the old part of Rome with lots of ruins, and they got together to have a cappuccino in a little cafe. And one of them said, you know, I've always been interested my whole life in archaeology, and now I had a chance to do something. So I made the most amazing discovery. And the friend says, what's that? He said, I know you're not going to believe it. But, you know, I dug around all around in the backyard of my villa, and I found the most amazing thing you're not going to believe. And the guy said, what was it? He said, well, I found a piece of copper wire. 
And the guy says, so? And he says, don't you realize, this shows the Romans already had the telegraph and the telephone. His friend, oh, wow, that's great, great. He, he, he too, you know, was interested in archaeology. He had a villa. He went in his villa, and he dug all around, he dug all around. They got together in the cafe to have another cappuccino. And he says, you think you discovered something. Wait till I tell you what I found. He said, what'd you find? He says, well, I dug all over in my backyard, and I didn't find a single piece of wire. Francis, so don't you realize the Romans already developed the radio? <laughs> So uh, Stewart's response to this stuff with the uh, GSI business uh, was to make a little computer game. Okay? It's called Make a Line. And what it did was it gave you a whole bunch of random data, a smooth data like this. And uh, you had to pick the cases where the target was good and where the target was bad, you know. And so <laughs> you picked it up, and if you were good at this game, you could read these lines just fantastically, okay? So, uh, but what Stewart didn't realize, okay, was that his game had actually been invented long ago, okay? In the real world, not in the virtual world, okay? Uh, there was a famous experiment uh, studying parity violation of nuclear forces by Weffler et al., where he made nitrogen-16, and then he looked to see the nitrogen-16 decays sometimes about a percent branch to this 2 minus level here in O16. And that 2 minus level is, can decay in principle to carbon-12 plus alpha, but it's forbidden by parity. Okay? And he looked and he decided to try to find that very weak alpha group from the decay of this level to carbon-12 plus alpha. And he found it, and it was a, it was a heroic experiment. Okay? But some uh, physicists in the Soviet Union uh, speculated that maybe it had nothing to do with parity violation. Okay? Maybe there was a really narrow resonance in carbon-12 plus alpha, a 2 plus resonance sitting right here. Okay. And so what was happening, it was a very, very weak decay, because it's forbidden, to this 2 plus level sitting right here. Okay. And uh, that would explain it. So they set out to do a carbon-12 plus alpha elastic scattering experiment. And the way you do these experiments, you set the beam energy very precisely, you change it by a little tiny bit, measure how the cross-section changes, and you go over like this. But, you know, they had to do this over and over again. <laughs> And, and these magnets that, you know, are used to determine the beam energy have some hysteresis in it. It's kind of hard, you know, if you really got to line these different, we call them excitation functions up, just right. So they found features in the excitation function, and they used that to line up on their spectra. They found a resonance. Now, this is one of the few times Stuart has ever been scooped, okay? These guys did it in the real world long before Stuart made his game. Okay. So... Uh, Although we found no evidence for a fifth force, okay, it turns out we were very lucky because uh, Fishbach's idea, though, turned out to be a really interesting one, namely that using these equivalence principle tests for probing a whole bunch of sort of speculative physics ideas, okay? So this shows the data that Fishbach had taken and analyzed from uh, Edvush days of old, and this shows uh, the points we measured, uh, you know, uh, this is from a paper in 1994. And we blow, we, here we blow up this so you can see the error bars. And there's, you see, we have very tiny error bars. There was no such thing. So uh, the way these experiments work, okay, it, it, you th think about it is if you have two different pendulums on, on the uh, face of a, ro a rotating Earth, okay, the pendulums uh, are subject to two different forces, uh, you know, gravity pulling you one way and the inertial force of the Earth's rotation pushing you outward. Okay? And uh, if inertial mass and gravitational mass are the same thing, those two forces are going to be uh, <clears throat> exactly uh, in the same ratio no matter what material you're hanging there. But if different materials have different ratios of inertial to gravitational mass, down is going to be a function of which material you're talking about. Okay? And so imagine you've got two different materials here with inertial to gravitational mass ratios differing as shown here, and you hang them as pendulums. If the equivalence principle is violated, those 
down directions will be different for the two objects. And the way you tell that is you hang the pendulums from a bar on a very fine wire. And if they hang in different directions, that bar is going to twist a little bit. And the observable thing would be to rotate the whole apparatus very carefully around this axis. And then that bar is going to twist in the other direction. So that's the basic principle of these tests. Okay? And uh, the history of this was this is exactly what Utmish did. Uh, he, he had something like this, and then he looked with a little telescope. He cranked his apparatus around by 180 degrees, and he came looking at his telescope again. Well, that's obviously a hard way to make a living because you build a very sensitive thing and then you jerk it around. <laughs> so that, that's not a good idea. So in the 1950s and 60s, Bob Dickey uh, did a much a uh, nicer job, uh, he, he said, look, you could watch things fall towards the sun. It only costs you a factor of three in signal, it turns out. Uh, and uh, let the Earth's rotation turn the apparatus for you for free. This was a nice idea. Uh, the, the only problem with it is once a day is about the worst possible frequency you can think of, except for once a year. Okay? And uh, so we... Here now we are looking for, uh, Dickey couldn't have seen this force, by the way, that Fishbach saw, because it was supposedly had a range in the kilometer range. So it, it wouldn't have been there in Dickey's experiment or Berginsky's experiment. And uh, we didn't want to uh, turn something around, so we had to develop a turntable to put these instruments on a turntable, and then we could pick our own frequency and watch them turn. Uh, the uh, Modern incarnation of this is right here. You know, there are eight test bodies, four of one kind, four of another. There's lots of stuff here. It looks very, very complicated, but if you could do a mass multipole analysis in your head, this thing, you know, assuming no machining errors, would differ from a sphere in the, sixth, in the seventh multipole order. Okay? And uh, we put it on a turntable. The turntables are now quite fancy. Uh, just show you this thing, but they, uh, the uh, revolution rate is, uh, you know, about a millihertz. And uh, a big problem in these experiments, as you can tell right here, is this picture, if torsion balances work because they're sensitive not to the magnitudes of any vectors here, but to the directions of them, okay? Because you can't make the magnitudes equal to anywhere near the precision we need. But it doesn't matter. You're just measuring directions. But the directions could be different for a trivial reason as well as the violation of the principle of equivalence. They could be different because the gravity field wasn't flat. Okay. And so that is, in fact, a kind of fundamental limitation to these experiments. How flat can you make the gravitational field? So we developed a whole technology for measuring the gradients, for canceling them out, and uh, this shows you uh, some recent results. This is a power spectrum of the t noise in the, or, or the power in the twist amplitude. And you can see the data. And this curve right here uh, is, is, the, is the thermal prediction for how the power ought to be distributed. That's the free torsional resonance. Okay, our signal would appear at this frequency. There is something, and then a second harmonic and third harmonic and so on. Uh, that, that is because pr pr predominantly, no matter how careful we c try to turn this thing around, it doesn't turn perfectly uniformly. Okay? So what we do is, once a day, we rotate the pendulum in the rotating apparatus and then keep running. Okay? And so any change, anything due to the turntable irregularity, doesn't change, but if there's something to do with the equivalence principle being violated, it has to change sign. Okay. And, uh, and then after months of data, we physically take those eight test bodies off the pendulum and interchange them. Okay. So we can say, is it a property of the suspension system in the frame of the pendulum, or is it a property of those test bodies themselves? Okay. And, uh, the, the data is shown here. I'm sort of running short on time, but uh, th this shows the effect of a whole bunch of data where you alternately, you know, every day you turn the thing around, and then we just interchange the test bodies on the pendulum, 
And uh, so it's the difference between this line and that line that are a measure of violation of the principle of equivalence. And the average of these lines or those lines uh, has to do with the imperfections in the suspension system and so on. Uh, and we get results at the couple parts in 10 to the 13 on the equality of the free fall accelerations. Uh, Stuart, you know, when I was doing these things, he told me null results are easy. In fact, I think he said something like null results are easy because you just could have had part of your apparatus <laughs> turned off and you'd still get a null result, something like that. But his point, his point was you've got to show that you, know, you could have seen something that you didn't. And this was what our torsion pendulum looked like in the early days. And so what we did was there are these four objects here. We took four ma masses, the total mass of about a kilogram, outside of the rotating uh, apparatus and put them there. And then the gravitational hexadecapole interaction, okay, uh, we, we arranged it so that its magnitude was, you know, uh, roughly, uh, uh, you know, a hundred times smaller than Dickey's uh, upper limit. And uh, there is the signal uh, of that thing. So we showed by that means, by building up a, uh, a very tiny gravitational signal from the gravitational hexadecapole interaction, uh, you know, and, and this really, uh, you know, Stuart was like, and he didn't assess this particular thing, but, but he said null results are easy, you know, you've got to prove that you can see it, and he's absolutely right. Okay. Oh, and just an amusing number, this differential acceleration resolution that we achieve is comparable to the difference in little g between two spots that are separated by a nanometer. Okay, so that, that shows you how important it is to take care of these gravity gradient issues. Okay, and uh, I, I don't want to be, uh, belabor this, I want to say, what, what are a couple things that you can do with this, okay? Gravity looks like, it is something that couples to mass, but uh, exchange forces, you know, like from exchange of uh, scalar or vector bosons or whatever, uh, couple to charges of some kind, okay? Not, not, not to mass. And so uh, if this is present, if you have something that is a quantum mechanical exchange force, uh, it necessarily violates the principle of equivalence, okay? And it necessarily violates, if it's a, a vector interaction, it's very easy to see that it has to violate the principle of equivalence because vector charges are conserved, so I have a collection of nucleons here, I'm, they've all got a certain vector charge, I let them coalesce into a neutral atom, okay? Uh, the vector charge hasn't changed, but the mass of the combination is less than the mass of the ingredients, okay? So that what matters is the charge to mass ratio, that's what determines the acceleration, okay? And the vector charge to uh, mass ratio is, uh, is obviously uh, not a universal thing. Electrons have one ratio, positrons have the opposite ratio. Okay? And uh, <clears throat> for electrically neutral objects, which are the only kind of things that any sane person would use to test the principle of equivalence, okay, you can, the most general uh, parameterization uh, is we say that the object consists of a certain number of hydrogens neutral hydrogen atoms plus a certain number of neutrons, and we say the charge is some weighted combination of these. We have no idea what it is, so there's some parameter psi that determines what the charge, you know, our sensitivity to any given charge is, okay? And then there's this parameter alpha that says how strong is this uh, force, and then there is the Yukawa length scale lambda. And so th those are how we can interpret our results, okay? And uh, so now what I want to do is say, what, what are some things you can do with this? Uh, well, what, one thing that, uh, that, that Christopher Stubbs originally uh, uh, made a point of is that we can use it to test the idea, is gravity the only long-range force between dark matter and uh, normal matter, okay? Because we can watch things fall in any direction we want. Since our turntable is going around, we always know where it is. So we can watch things falling towards the center of the galaxy just as easily as we can watch them falling to the center of the Earth, okay? 
And so here's an edge on view. There's the University of Washington, and there's all this dark matter cloud around here. Okay. And uh, it, it turns out that the uh, acceleration uh, at the UW towards the center of the galaxy is uh, 1.85 to 10 to the minus 8 centimeters per second squared. Now that's, uh, you know, we're talking about 10 to the minus 13 precision now here, uh, centimeters per second, okay. So that's big compared to the resolution we have. And although most of the dark matter lies outside uh, the radius of Seattle, <laughs> uh, so although most of the matter is dark uh, in the whole galaxy, uh, actually the amount of acceleration you can estimate due to the stuff inside here is, you know, 5 10 to the minus 9 centimeters per second. Well, that's still a lot bigger than 10 to the minus 13. And so uh, by looking at a bunch of different materials, measuring only their differential acceleration, we can make some statements about how big these accelerations, non-gravitational accelerations of dark matter are. Okay? So we have here, excel the blue is the acceleration due to normal gravity, and this is the acceleration uh, due to the dark matter that may have a component which violates the principle of equivalence. And if you do that, you can put a constraint on how much of the interaction with neutral hydrogen with the galactic dark matter could be non-gravitational. And you know, it's, uh, it's it, it, for some values of this charge, it's very good, only a part in 10 to the fourth. For others, where they're unfortunate, where you know, the charge looks pretty much like baryon number, which is pretty close to mass, okay, uh, it, it's not so good. But because we have multiple test bodies, uh, et cetera, uh, we, we can make an interesting statement. And the last thing uh, is uh, about the gravitational properties of antimatter. I, I told you I'm going to uh, not, you know, I'm not speaking for anyone but myself. Uh, some people think antihydrogen can fall up, okay? In fact, that was a subject of another Morion meeting where I couldn't believe what I was hearing. <laughs> uh, and, uh, so you ask, how, how plausible is it that it can have a different acceleration than hydrogen? Okay. At that point, people were talking about antiprotons to show you how bad it was, okay? Uh, if hydrogen and antihydrogen fall with different accelerations, okay, gravity must have a vector component. Uh, that's clear, okay? And uh, so imagine that you have an experiment. Uh, you put, it's a very hard experiment, okay? They're trying to do it, sir, and, you know, cool anti-hydrogen down enough so that you can actually drop it and measure it to precision, okay? Really hard, okay? And so, but suppose we could put one of these things right where our apparatus is, okay? Uh, and we, we think about in our language, that's a case where we have the delta Z over mu of two. It's plus one for hydrogen, minus one for anti-hydrogen, okay? Uh, our tests uh, with beryllium and aluminum test bodies have uh, a delta Z over mu of 0.04, roughly. Okay? Well, that's smaller, but it isn't enormously smaller. Okay? On the other hand, our experiment is a hell of a lot easier compared to the other one. Okay? And, so, and we don't see anything. Uh, and, and so we can calculate, you know, we, there's a big model of the Earth we have to use to calculate our sensitivity to things falling sideways, but we can also see what that model tells you about things falling straight down, okay? And uh, it, it turns out that in the following plot, I, I, again, I've, I'll tell you what it's based on. It assumes CPT invariance, okay? And uh, it, it, it assumes that exact cancellation between vector interaction and supposedly some additional scalar interaction isn't possible, okay? That's, I believe, all I'm assuming. Uh, then you get very tight constraints on how different could the acceleration of hydrogen and anti-hydrogen be uh, based on the arguments I make here. Here, uh, I assume that the charge actually happens to be uh, you know, neutrons don't have any. Here, I say, whatever, let the charge be whatever it can be so they have the least possible sensitivity, weight neutrons and protons in the worst possible way, okay? And uh, so, so this is weighted the worst possible way, and this is uh, with the, you know, the, the, the charge is just an anti-hydrogen and not on a neutron. But those are very small numbers, 
and uh, it would be, uh, again, I would be kind of surprised. Now, you know, do we know that gravity obeys CPT? No, we don't. Uh, but uh, there are probably, you know, there are a lot of other easier ways to test CPT than this. But I'm not saying you shouldn't do it at all. I just say I think the chances are very small. Okay, Stuart, I think, would have uh, agreed with this moral that I'm going to leave you with. Um, although I don't know for a fact he would, but, you know, wrong results that measure something, okay, motivate the kind of beautiful experiments that Stuart loved to do, okay? And they prevent you from going down seductive blind alleys. You know, it keeps the theorists from salivating quite so much at these little oddities that come up, okay? Uh, but in fact, you know, sometimes it turns out they have unexpected side effects, benefits, okay? For instance, Weber's discovery of gravity waves. It was not real. But, you know, if he hadn't done that, we wouldn't be looking so seriously for gravity waves today, okay? Uh, when I was a graduate student, uh, there was a rumor from uh, SIN, that's what it was called in those days, okay, that mu to e gamma had branch ratio about 10 to minus 9 or something. Until that moment, okay, it was obvious to everybody, I was taking, you know, field theory from Murray Gell-Mann, okay, it was obvious that lepton number was conserved, okay. Uh, after this r rumor came out, suddenly it was obvious that it wasn't, sort of, okay, and it's still a real issue n now, okay. And, uh, and I think the fifth force was an example. It wasn't real, okay. But it made people realize that there is a lot you can learn by looking underneath gravity, so to speak. Okay? And uh, this uh, celebration of Stewart's uh, many contributions to physics that began with his PhD thesis okay, and continued to the very end okay, is only the part of the reason why he had so many friends among his colleagues. Okay? He had this unforgettable style, you know, the twinkle in his eyes when he knew <laughs> a zinger was going to come out, you know. And uh, his, his sort of crusty uh, skepticism, you know, uh, you know, they brightened all of our lives, okay. You know, whenever Stewart spoke, uh, you knew it was going to be fun, you knew it was going to be really first class. Uh, it, it, you know, people have said that physics hasn't had any great personality since uh, Feynman died, okay. That wasn't true as long as Stuart was with us, okay? So Joyce and Paul, thank you so much for uh, sharing Stuart with all of us. <laughs>